Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by Jennifer Morrison to talk all about her work as an actor, producer, and director in the industry. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the genesis of your production company, Apartment 3C Productions, because I know that you, you created and set up the company shortly after your first directorial short film, Warning Labels, um, and was just interested in, in for you kind of like what the genesis and, and the tipping point at that point in your career was where it wasn't even just about starting to create your own work as a director and starting to pursue those types of projects, but really wanting to expand upon that into a production company where you could have a lot of autonomy over the voice and the type of projects that you were helping to bring into the industry? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And um, it, it, it was shortly after warning labels. Um, and in a weird way, it was connected to a lot of logistical needs initially. Um, I definitely dreamed of all the things you were saying. You know, I was dreaming of having that autonomy someday. I was dreaming of having a, a place where I could develop content that I not, it didn't necessarily have to be acting in or that I could be producing or directing. So that dream was there. Um, and what really kind of pushed me was that I was putting together Sundogs, which was my first feature. And I, you know, it's really, really hard to get a first feature made. And I don't, I don't know if there's any way to actually fully articulate it. It's like when you, when you meet another person who's a filmmaker, who's made a film, you immediately are like, oh, I know I've been there. You know, like, you know, you kind of feel that camaraderie with that person. Um, but so anyway, I was, I was putting that together and I was, I was, I was still working on, um, uh, uh, once upon a time at when, when I did this. So I was trying to squeeze it in this very tiny window of time. And because of that, there was no room for error. And I was an unproven filmmaker. And so I needed to get people to take my meetings, these finance companies to take my meetings. And we realized that if I bet on myself, um, that it would get me in certain doors. And so I set up up, um, I set up apartment 3C to be kind of the first money in. And now I tell people all the time, everyone tells you do not put money into your own projects. So I am not advocating this. I'm not saying it is always the way to go. It worked out in my case. Um, but it was a way to have an entity that could house the script title and it could also house um, the finances that I was saying that I was going to put into the film. Um, so that was kind of the early, early genesis of it. Um, and then once that film got made and once that went well and we went to festivals and we sold it to Netflix, uh, I did make my money back. Everybody made their money back, which is also rare. <laughs> um, then it became more of uh, me kind of digging deeper to the things you were just talking about earlier and saying, okay, what's next? How do I turn this into something that can really be a pipeline for projects that I believe in? And the tricky part about that was that because I was still working so much as an actor, there would be all these fits and starts, you know, I would sort of get something going and I would, I'd, I'd move it up the hill a certain amount. And then I'd have to pause because I was away working on something. And that's why I just recently partnered with um, three other people. I partnered with my brother, my, his wife, and my husband. Um, we all bring something different to the table. My brother's a great development executive. My husband has great relationships with writers and he's been bringing projects into us. And my sister-in-law is more on the marketing side of things. And she's been helping us with the marketing for the book club and the branding for everything. So we kind of all bring different things to the table. And by having the four of us now, it's made it so that I, we really can expand. So, you know, we have a project with anonymous content that we're about to take to market. Um, we're partnering with them with something else actually, because that went well. Um, and we have a couple other things that are like in that sort of development pitch phase where we will take those to market in the next year. So um, in addition to the book club that I was just saying with my, my sister-in-law. So, um, so yeah, so now I feel like because I have that support system, I'm able to um, keep us all spinning in that cycle together. And we're really seeing the results that are, that are moving a lot faster. That's so great. And you're obviously bringing up the book club there, which is a fairly recent part of the company and an extension in which you're taking a different book each month and, and really, you know, not just kind of saying, OK, I've put my stamp of approval. I think this is a great book, but trying to create a dialogue around it and have conversations. And and, um, you know, you've done some really great interview pieces with the authors that you've selected from these books as well that you've put out there. Um, how did you kind of approach what you wanted that to look like with all these added aspects that you're trying to bring, you know, essentially kind of like carrying the book, not just for the beginning of the month, but really kind of like carrying people through, okay, now you're reading it. Now you want to dive a little bit deeper. We're going to have that conversation with you. 
I love that you noticed that. Everything you're saying is making me so happy <laughs> because we really focused on that. Um, I am a book lover. We are all book lovers. This this was as much as we know that this is something that will help the company and can help us find content. It really was just born of our love affair with books. And I'm constantly looking for my next book. I'm constantly scouring the internet and different websites and different Instagram things. You know, like I'm always looking for the next great book. It's what's bonded me with some of my best friends. You know, Rose MacGyver and I were constantly giving each other books back and forth on the set, you know? So this is really coming from something that I love so much that I was like, how, how, how can I make the thing I wish existed? And I always felt a little bit let down by like, oh, they announced the book. And then I'm like, and now what, you know, like, and, and also like, it's a commitment to read a book. It's a commitment to commit that much, it's a commitment to commit, um, to, to spend that much time with something. And so I want to know if I'm going to go buy that book, that it's worth it, you know? So we wanted to set up a system where if someone sees us go, okay, I will die in a foreign land is our book of the month for July. It's not just that we're announcing it, that we're going to give them quotes from the book. We're going to give them an interview with the author. We're going to give them little snippets of press or little um, excerpts of the book so that you can actually decide maybe a couple of weeks into the month, like, oh, this is something I really want to read, you know, and or or maybe it's not. And that's totally fine, too. But at least we've given you enough of an experience of the tone and the vibe and the energy of the book and the author to make that decision for yourself. So that kind of came from just me wishing someone else was doing that. So I was like, Oh, if no one else is doing it. I'll do it. Um, so, and, and the other side of that is that I'm very fascinated and all of us at apartments we see are fascinated with process. Um, you know, the creative process is so interesting because no one does anything the same way. You know, we all have a different journey toward the end product and, because you spend so much time in the journey and not in the result, it's like, how can you enjoy and sort of dive deeper into that journey part? And, and so for us to be able to talk to the authors and spend that time talking with the authors and give them a chance to talk about their process, we learn from them. And we also are inspired by the way they go on that journey. There's always things in the interviews with the authors. You know, there's only a couple out there right now, but there's several that I've already backlogged and I felt like every time I got off of an interview with an author, I had added something to my tool set just from being able to talk to them about their process. So it really came from a genuine love and interest in wanting to know more about books. And then also that curiosity that we have about process. And I love what you're saying there about the process always being different for everybody. But even within that, for you as a, as a creative, every project you do has a different process for you as well. And I love some of those videos that you've been posting of some of the journals that you've created mm -hmm. in the past characters as an actor, you know, because obviously your role on This Is Us required very, very specific research, very specific backstory. That's going to be really different to the work that you did for something like Once Upon a Time or something like House. Um, and, but I also love kind of seeing that, that part of your process in terms of thinking about as a director. And so did you find when you flipped flipped over to directing and stepped into that realm that though it was kind of like an expansion of the type of research projects that you've been creating for yourself for all these years and and how did that really help giving you a foundation of the types of research and the types of materials that you needed to pull together as a filmmaker yeah it it, it is very very similar um it, it's it's like for me and I don't know how this is for other people but for me it's like having a safety net to have those things that you can rely on that are your starting point the process and the journey is going to be super different, but I know where to start. And I think that that's when you don't know where to start, that's when you feel lost. And so there's so many times I look at a script and I don't immediately have a visual plan. You know, it's not like, you know, I think there's some sort of fantasy that every filmmaker looks at a script and they're like, oh, I see the vision. You know, it's like, you know, occasionally, you know, a shot comes to mind or there's a, there's a scene that, that jumps forward and you're like, oh, I could see how I'd want to shoot this. But for the most part, you, you have to start like peeling back and going like, what are the themes? What are they really talking about? What's this writer trying to express? Because you want to put all the metaphor of that into the visual. So then once you start answering those questions for yourself, I have this place that I can start, which is very similar to where I start as an actor, which is as an actor, I'm pulling images that feel like they relate to the character. As a director, I'm pulling images that feel like they relate to the storytelling and the themes and the symbols and, you know, all of the sort of like underlying metaphors of a story. Um, 
And then, you know, it, from there you build out of like, well, what memoirs could I read? What information can I consume that's going to help get me inside the heartbeat of this? And the difference really is just with a character, you're only dealing with this one specific person. And with, and when you're dealing with a, a film or a television show, you're dealing with every character and every element of the visual and every element of the style. So it's just a different, um, it's like a more global <laughs> approach to everything, I guess. But, but it is very similar. And I think because I had spent so many years doing it um, as an actor, it wasn't as intimidating to start chipping away at finding that process. And every project I work on adds to that project. I mean, adds to that process. You know, it's, there's always something new that kind of like slips into the cycle of things that feels like it's contributive to the end result. And you were, you were bringing up Sundogs earlier, which was your first feature directorial film. Um, you know, and I, I remember hearing you talk about that film in in kind of really finding the balance of the tone because you mm. were working with, you know, very weighty subject matter, but also making sure that there were elements of lightness within it as well. Um, and the film did that really successfully. And I was interested in, you know, going into your first feature and having something that required such delicacy in the approach in terms of that tone and that balance, um, how that experience really has helped you as a foundation on all of the other projects that you've gone into, because you've worked on so many projects that all have similarly like very <laughs> tough <different> subjects. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's another great question. You know, I, um, I think the biggest thing that came out of it was my, my faith in the edit. Um, and, and also my faith in my instincts in the moment, because there were there were some things that were on the page that I decided against in the moment on Sundogs. Now, obviously, this is different because it was my feature. So I could actually do that. I would never do that on a television show if that wasn't mine. You know, there's there's a there's a different um uh, commitment to the showrunner and, you know, relationship with the showrunner that would change how I would approach this. So when I'm saying this, I'm really truly saying this about a feature. Um, but, and, you know, and it's a little scary to make that decision because you think, well, but it's on the page and so many people have read it and they like it. But, um, looking back, it wouldn't have, it would not have allowed the scenes to slide into the tone that it needed to slide into. So it gave me faith in that instinct, like that really strong thing in the moment where you're like, something's off. I've got to, I've got to fix this, you know? But the other thing it gave me faith in is, you know, you, you get into the edit bay and you get this assembly from the editor and the editor is sort of committed to putting every word that's in the script and everything that's in the actions and everything in the script into this. So they're not trimming anything back. They're not making any executive decisions for the most part. Sometimes if you have a really close relationship with an editor, they'll take some bigger creative liberties. But for the most part, you're just getting what's on the page as straightforward as possible, which is usually really hard to watch. <laughs> um, an editor's assembly, no fault of the editor, but just because of the process makes you very itchy. Um, but you get in there and you start to realize what you have, you know, and, and as Sundogs was going through the editing process, because it was the first time I was ever putting something together that was that big. Um, there were times that I'd think, oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to fix this sequence. We're not, it's not going to, did we shoot enough or did we, you know, and, and I would doubt myself. And it was just that constant digging of like, oh, but if you shift this here, or if you just take this moment out or it just made me really have faith that um, you can always dig deeper in that part of the process to, I don't know, I, it's hard to articulate this, but it's like really thinking about how one image next to another image has such a different power to you, you know? And so you can, you just flip out that one and put something else there. And all of a sudden your experience of a scene is totally different. You know, you could, you could flip one wrong reaction in a scene in Sundogs and it could seem like we were making fun of Ned. And we never wanted that. And nor was that our hurt for it when we, when we were shooting the scenes, but just the wrong reaction at the wrong moment could tip it that way. Whereas like you, you take that out or you stay with him a little bit longer, or you cut to a, something that is in the room for a second. And all of a sudden you're evening out that tone. So it gave me a lot of faith that there was um, just a lot of leeway to like keep searching for those things instead of being like, well, I guess it, I guess it doesn't work, you know? Um, and I think that that's really served me, um, especially working on the television shows I've been working on, because you, you have to move at such a crazy fast pace and you're doing the absolute best you can in the moment to get as many options as you can and try to get variations in the performance. And 
I feel like I'm constantly telling actors the things that, you know, directors are coming and telling me, being like, I know this sounds annoying, but please trust me. Like, I promise I'll use the best take, but we've got to try to have some variations here because otherwise, you know, we might really be screwed in the edit. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's something that um, has really given me faith in the edit process and has really uh, made me trust that that's, that's something you can, you can really rely on in the long run. I also love what you were saying at the, at the beginning about, you know, making certain choices because it, it was your project that you wouldn't necessarily do things the same way in television. And you you had Fabled, which was a, another film that you directed that was a feature, but that was kind of like your first experience of being hired onto something as a director that had already gone through a lot of development process when you came on board. And so was that really helpful to have this project that was kind of this middle ground of, you know, you're directing a feature, so there are certain elements elements of autonomy and freedom that you can bring to it, but also there's a specific vision already there that you're kind of marrying yourself into because television is, is also this very unique space where I think it's a very underappreciated skill set in that there is a visual language that you have to come into, but also you are there making autonomous decisions in a lot of ways as well. Yeah, it's <clears throat> television is really tricky that way because I was actually recently talking about this in an interview because they were like, what do you, why do you think it is that it's so tricky sometimes with these, you know, cause I was saying there are certain directors that come in who kind of have a chip on their shoulder and they, I saw it a lot as an actor, you know, where you, you knew immediately if someone's like, I'm going to change everything. And you're like, that's not your job. <laughs> you know, like they're going to change it back, <laughs> you know? So, um, and they were saying, why do you think that happens? And, and, I feel like it's it is a really tricky role that is a little bit underappreciated in the industry, which is you're asked to be so sure and so confident confident as a filmmaker and to make all these autonomous decisions that you're talking about. And then you walk into a television set and they're like, be that confident, be that autonomous, and also submit to something. And it's it's such a oppositional thing, you know. And I think I had a natural ability to kind of give myself over to it only because I had watched a television set ecosystem for a countless hours over so many years and 300 plus episodes of television to sort of have a sense of how to find that balance. But I can't imagine if you didn't have that experience behind you to try to guess how to navigate that, you know? So you're totally correct that it is a very tricky line to walk. Um, and I think that, you know, there was a lot that I learned from Fable because of the fact that I was not as much a part of the development process. And I think that, you know, it, I learned some things in a good and a bad way. You know, I mean, the good things that I learned was that it's really exciting when you bring a collaborative team together and you start to see all of these um, different elements that you can pull together. There's such a unique creativity that can flourish out of that where it's not just your imagination, it's several other imaginations. Um, but I also found that um, I didn't know, it wasn't sort of clearly delineated going into that project um, where my autonomy lied and where it did not. And so it made me much more aware of needing to define those things going into a project in the future. And it wasn't that it was a problem. We all got along. It was great. But I was aware that that those are things that should have been talked about ahead of time instead of being worked out in the moment, you know? So now I have extensive conversations going in to understand what does a showrunner want from me? What do they need from me? You know, what, what are the things that are going to help you? What are the things you just need me to back off on? Um, you know, when do you want me to kind of, you know, spread my wings a little bit and sort of take some risks? And when do you want me to step back? And having those conversations actually make it so beneficial when you go into that set environment, because then you're not guessing. And I think everything that you were saying about directing television as well, where there is in essence a certain element of a roadmap that you have to stick to. Um, I was interested in that in terms of when you, you know, if a show's been in existence for a few seasons and there's episodes that you can look at, there's a way that you can really study it. But there's projects that you've worked on, like Euphoria, where you were directing an episode in series one where you know it wasn't on the air yet so there wasn't that ability to look at what everybody else had been doing directorially or one of us is lying where you directed the first episode of, of the show um and so how do you kind of like balance that differently where again there's still a, a roadmap that you need to kind of find but you don't necessarily have the visual element of studying and researching and really looking at other episodes for it you know is it is it much more about the the collaboration and those conversations you were saying with the showrunner yeah, a lot of it that goes into it. I mean, I, I always feel like the beginning of a project is 
just personality investigation. You know, it's, I, I am just trying to get as many people on the phone as I can and ask as many questions as possible to start feeling things out. But, um, it is crazy because it's, you know, most of the television I've directed has been first season. All of it has been first season, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. So, um, and I know that that was sort of on purpose. You know, my my agent for this is, has really wanted that to be the case because she knows that you're still contributing to the visual language when you're in that building process with them in that first season. Um, but I don't know what other people do. And, and I, again, there's no set way to do this, but I'm very devoted to dailies. Um, watching the dailies. And it's been super helpful for me to to do that. It's a huge time commitment and it can be um, overwhelming, you know, when you're like, oh, wow, I have however many episodes worth of dailies to dig through here. But especially the first two episodes, you know, if I, if the first episode isn't mine, I really like to watch the dailies as much of the dailies as I can of the first two episodes, because I learn a lot about where they started on day one and where they ended on day, whatever, you know, and you see the visual style kind of evolve in front of you. You start to see the lenses they start to choose over and over again. You start to see like, do they use zooms? Do they not use zooms? Like what is this sort of compositional framing that they're starting to rely on that feels like it's emerging as a pattern on the show because I, I won't have even seen a cut together episode sometimes. So I'm having to go off of just my own observation of patterns in dailies that, that emerge. And um, so that's super, super helpful for me. I also feel like um, the cinematographers are really the unsung heroes of television and, you know, you either have one person doing all of it, or they're usually nowadays they are getting better about alternating them, which really helps because at least you have them prepping with each director as opposed to just always being on set and not having them prep with you. And um, those conversations I find are super helpful because if you can really kind of earn their trust, which takes a second, they're always very suspicious of people. I don't know why that's like a trait of a cinematographer, but um but I end up, I, I love, I mean, I have such a, such a soft spot in my heart for like every cinematographer I've ever worked with, but, um, but yeah, they, they end up being an incredible resource in terms of the patterns on set, the pace at which things move, the things that they've overheard the showrunner say that they like, you know, the, the, the things that were ideas early on that somehow kind of went away, you know, they're like, well, they said that we were going to do this, but then after like three days we never did it again, you know? So I think that they're an incredible resource. Um, and yeah, and, and really just every showrunner is different and every showrunner, it depends on how busy and spread thin they are, but really that's the best place to get your information. And I've really come to enjoy it because I've been able to expand my taste, you know, because I'm partnering with people that do things in a way that maybe wouldn't have been my first instinct, but then I learn how to embrace that instinct. And it's exciting to go, oh, I really like this, or maybe it's not my thing, but I see how it works for this, you know? Um, and it's much less lonely, you know, it, it can be very lonely to step on these sets and feel like you're the one person passing through and everybody else is kind of always there. So when you kind of find that, you know, connection with the showrunner, you feel like you're partnered into something as opposed to just praying that it goes okay. I also wanted to ask about the experience of, of directing an episode on Dr. Death as well, because, you know, that's that's a very different type of approach. Firstly, it's it's more of a factual narrative. Um, and from the way that everyone on that show talks about it, it sounds like there was a real sensibility to the fact that, you know, with Christopher Dunch, there's still victims of his who are alive and, and are potentially going to see this show. Mm -hmm. And so that there was a lot of sensitivity to not always telling the story that would be the most heightened and dramatic element for a TV show, but what felt really grounded and true to the actuality of what happened um and so how did that kind of change and shift the the dynamic of coming in and directing kind of knowing all of those things going into it yeah it's interesting because i i also had an interesting block of episodes because i was episodes three and four um three was still very straightforward and four was almost entirely a fantasy so um or not maybe entirely but like half of it or something and and so I had a little bit of a mixture of both, you know, there was, there was, what I was aware of going into that block was that there was a lot of concern about the fantasy sequence because this was the only departure from doing all the protecting you were just talking about where it was an invention of, of the writers uh, with the intention of having this moment for the audience to fantasize that Dr. Dunch and Henderson have this conflict 
which never happened in real life. And so the concern from even from like a legal perspective was like, how do you make sure that people know that we are telling them that this is not real? And this is an example of like, I had had a vision really early on. It was like probably the first time I read the script, I saw this sequence in my head. And I was like, I promise you the way I shoot this, no one's going to think it's real. Like you can't think it's real. Um, and so that that became like a huge departure from reality where I called it the impossible bathroom, but we built the impossible bathroom where I could have angles. I could shoot from angles that in real life or in a real space, you just could never shoot from. And so every shot in those bathrooms was sort of from a position that shouldn't have been possible in a practical space. You know, we built it on 12 foot stilts so that I could shoot under the, the glass floor. We finished the outside, outside of the windows so that we could shoot from the outside and see them inside. Even inside, we had it so that you could gimbal the mirrors really extremely so that we would get shots that if those mirrors were properly placed, there's no way you would be seeing what you were seeing. Um, so, you know, it was just, everything was about how do you give people this implication of the impossible? Um, so that was the kind of the opposite of what you're, um, talking about in terms of, of the truth of all of it. And so then the other stuff, I felt like Maggie Kiley did such a beautiful job of establishing this grounded truthfulness and, um, a really generous heartbeat toward the victims as well as the, all of the actors. And so I was really just looking at what she was doing and finding a way to, you know, continue, continue on that path in terms of making sure everybody felt, felt grounded and real. And really, I think the heavy lifting with that was in the writing. You know, I think that Patrick McManus and his whole team did an incredible job of finding that sort of middle ground that you want to find, which is yes, we're telling the truth. Yes. We need to entertain people but also we want to be respectful to the people that went through all of this, you know, and, and excitingly um, I have just closed my deal to direct the first four episodes of season two of Dr. Death. So I will be back in the Dr. Death world for quite a while. Um, and I can tell you that they're, they're doing the same thing in a way that I find really, really inspiring um, where, you know, you're digging into these, characters but they're real people you're digging into these real people who who are flawed and have made mistakes and you know even when you're not talking about the person who's sort of like the villainous doctor but like the people around them and the mistakes that they made and there's so much humanity in the way that Ashley Michael Hoban who wrote this season and is show running this season how she's approached it and um I I wish that in real life we all had the same regard for humanity that like this team of writers has taken because I think if we all stopped and had this kind of empathy for like, wait, how did you get here? How did this happen? How did these mistakes fall in line? Like, how did the system miss it? You know, as opposed to just like yelling and screaming about it. I think we'd probably be in a better place culturally. I'm sure you're right about that. You know, and, and one of, one of the great things that you were saying before in having worked on over 300 episodes of television as an actor is just that training ground, like you said, even of just getting to watch how every single director comes in, how they approach, getting to see the whole ecosystem of how it all works. But I know that you were also incredibly conscientious in, in your time when you were acting and, and kind of knowing that you wanted to go into directing of studying things, having conversations, asking a lot of questions on set as well, which, you know, gives you a certain skill set when you walk into the directing chair for the first time. But I was interested in, even with all of that studying and all of that information and all the directors that you essentially got the chance to kind of watch and shadow to a degree, what were some of the aspects of directing that you found in those early projects that no matter how much you read, no matter how much you study, no matter how much you see, you just can't really know it until you experience it? Yeah, I think I'm trying to think back to it because it's, I, I feel very lucky that I've gotten into a place where it, it feels so natural for me now. So I'm trying to think back to those early days. And I think one of the things that people say this, but until you're actually doing it, it does feel kind of crazy, which is just the sheer number of decisions you're making on a daily basis. And this is why I love prep. I really, really, really believe in prep and I'm very committed to trying to have as clear a vision as possible in the prep process because it makes being on set so much more lovely. Um, but like, if you were to have a dinner table set, you're going to be asked the question, and this will happen in prep, but you're going to be asked the question like, 
is this a tablecloth restaurant? Is it not? Where have they started dinner? Have they not? Is this a place that like sets the whole table before you get there? Like what kind of menu? Is it big? Is it small? Is it printed? Do they print it every day? Do they, uh, you know, have they filled their water glasses yet? Does this person drink sparkling water or do they drink straight water? You know, like, and like, it, I mean, this is just the beginning. You, there are 20,000 questions just about what goes on that table and what happens with the menu and what kind of restaurant it is. And even once you get there on the day and you've answered those 20,000 questions, somehow there's another 20,000. It's like, is the candle lit or is it not lit? Or is it over here or is it over there? Or like, you know, so um, I have a very high um, bandwidth now for question answering in a day. Um, but it's like a muscle you have to build. Like at first you get to, you reach your like 10,000 question mark, you know, level. And you're like, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm fatigued. I don't know. I do whatever you want, put whatever you want on the table, you know? And then you start to grow that muscle. And eventually, you know, now it's, it's really sweet because people are aware of it, especially department heads are aware of it. And they'll say, do you have the bandwidth for, and I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like, I can jump around a lot faster between things. Um, I was just recently doing this on Grease Rise of the Pink Ladies where because of COVID, they had sort of pushed their dates so much that the director that was working on um, the last episode had, had a hard out, had to leave. And so they flew me in to sort of take over when he had to leave. And so I hadn't been in the prep process and I hadn't been there to, to do all the things I normally do. And I was just like jumping in within a 24 hour notice um, and so there were a lot of questions coming at me and I was just like, oh, thank God I have grown this muscle to be able to just like, go like, no, it's okay. I got it. Like, I know we're doing this scene now, but we got to worry about tomorrow. Cause like, I've never seen that set. So let's talk about it. You know? So, um, I think that that's probably the biggest thing that you can't quite prepare yourself for. You can mentally know it's coming, but I think you have to just grow the muscle for sure. I mean, I think, I think an experience like that as well and them using you in that way is obviously such a testament to the work that you've built up as a director and, and the way that you work. And I love the way that you talk kind of so intricately about all of those details and decisions. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. Really appreciate it, Jennifer. Yeah.